tonight on Nova. A river rages out of control. Along its banks, people brace for catastrophe. It just became like a monster that you couldn't catch up to, and it, it just kept coming. It was the biggest flood fight in U.S. history, but the battle to contain the Mississippi was doomed to failure. You know how you always figure hard work and determination will take care of everything? Well, you can't beat Mother Nature sometimes. It was a real cruel lesson to learn. The drama and the dilemma of the flood. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television. This program is funded in part by the Northwestern Mutual Foundation. Some people already know Northwestern Mutual can help plan for your children's education. Are you there yet? Northwestern Mutual Financial Network. Science. It's given us the framework to help make wireless communications clear. Sprint PCS is proud to support NOVA. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. It is the summer of 1993. Record amounts of rainfall are drenching the upper Midwest. Farmers fear the loss of their crops as fields already saturated from a year of wet weather turn into lakes. But the rain keeps coming. Rivers throughout the Midwest rise dangerously high. These swollen tributaries pour into the mighty Mississippi, which begins to press against her levees. Running along the river's edge, these large earthen walls prevent the river from flooding adjoining farms and towns. But by early July, the levees are beginning to weaken. Evacuation orders are issued while there is still time to escape. Unfolding in slow motion, a flood is unlike any other natural disaster. Earthquake, boom, sudden impact, flood, a leisurely disaster. The river's caretakers, the Army Corps of Engineers, are thrust into a state of emergency. I, I hear they got uh, two to three million out there at Camp Dodge. Get rid of some of that water. Yes, sir. By mid-July, National Guard units from around the country are sent in to help in what is becoming an all-out war against nature. It just became like a monster that you couldn't catch up to. It was like trying to grab the wind. I mean, every day they changed the rules on us, and, and it, it just, we could never catch up to it. it. It just kept coming. By August 1st, the river appears unstoppable. Tens of thousands of residents are forced from their homes. Livestock scramble for high ground. And some people narrowly escape with their lives.
uprooting entire communities, destroying property, disrupting life over a nine-state area. This was the most costly flood in U.S. recorded history. It all began when a freakish weather pattern over the Midwest produced an unusually wet summer. Meteorologist Paul Douglas. To be honest, meteorologists were baffled. We were perplexed with this situation. During a typical year, the jet stream is constantly on the move. The jet stream is a high-speed river of air. The superhighway for storms is always in motion. And so you may get flooding for a week or two, but then the jet stream shifts and a drier pattern moves in. During 1993, we had a major shift in the pattern. For some strange reason, we had a giant blocking high pressure system over the southeast, a heat pump high. And this roadblock in the atmosphere forced the jet stream to take a more or less continuous detour across the Midwest. That produced wave after wave of storms. Now this is a three-dimensional representation of what the storms looked like. Moisture flowing north from the Gulf of Mexico, converging when it reaches cool Canadian air. Consistent storms over the Midwest, not just for a week or two, which would be typical, but for month after month after month. And this was the result. Nine states experiencing the worst flooding in history, 30 inches of rain in a six-month period. Not only was there river flooding, there was flash flooding, where farmers' fields turned into ponds and then lakes. Literally, meteorologists referred to Iowa as the sixth great lake for about a six-week stretch. There's no way the ground can absorb that volume of water. It had to run off into streams and rivers, and the result was the worst flooding our nation has ever seen. No one could have predicted the flood of 1993. Most years, the Mississippi flows peacefully within its banks, enticing millions of Americans to live and work along its shores. The Mississippi Valley is one of the most fertile in the world, providing food and jobs for millions. The river is also a superhighway for commerce, moving some $50 billion worth of industrial and agricultural goods through the nation's heartland every year. Beginning as a modest river in northern Minnesota, the Mississippi flows nearly 2,400 miles south to the Gulf of Mexico. Along the way, it draws water from thousands of tributaries across 31 states and two Canadian provinces. Floods are nothing new for the Mississippi, which has overrun its banks countless times for tens of thousands of years. But in the early part of this century, as more people began to live along the Mississippi, these upheavals of nature turned into human tragedies. In the 1930s, on the heels of massive flooding, the federal government directed the Army Corps of Engineers to take on the task of taming the mighty Mississippi River. The engineers went to work and devised a master plan. The scale of their projects was enormous and included the construction of some of the largest civil works projects in the world. Reservoirs, dams, and thousands of miles of levees were built to control floods and to make the area safer for people to live and work. Once in place, these flood control structures projected an aura of invincibility and gave people confidence that nature was under control. Development thrived in an area that was once the exclusive domain of the river. But the Mississippi, like other rivers that flood, would not be so easily controlled. The Egyptians, in the Book of the Dead, uh, warned us that thou shalt not hinder the waters of inundation. They, they recognized that, um, that in order for those, those bottom lands to remain fertile, that the river had to regularly interact and that there had to be this regular flooding to keep those bottom lands healthy.
the Mississippi has to interact with its floodplain in order to collect the leaves and debris and other organic material that form the base of the river's food chain. Most of the time, the floodplain of the Mississippi is available to people, but uh, every so often, uh, whether it's this year or, or next year or 10 years from now, the river reoccupies its floodplain. It's something we know will happen. It's not a matter of whether the river will reoccupy its floodplain, but when. In late June of 1993, the Mississippi threatened to flood a farming community outside Quincy, Illinois. Lynn and Alec House own 1,400 acres along the river. I remember when we first started, well, Alec actually first started coming down here on a daily basis the first week of July, and he'd come home one night, and I was asking him, you know, how serious is this? I mean, I know that you're down there and you're shoring it up. Is that going to be enough? And he shook his head and he said, levees are going to break like guitar strings up and down the upper Mississippi River Valley. At stake for landowners in the Quincy area were 110,000 acres of fertile farmland with crops ready to be harvested. This broad sloping levee called the Sny was designed to hold back a moderate flood, one that occurs on average every 50 years. But that summer, the levee made of sand and clay would face a 500 year flood. The trouble began when six inches of rain pummeled the Quincy area, causing the river to rise perilously close to the top of the 52-mile Sny Levee. Um, it was coming up at one point an inch an hour, and that's very, very fast. Um, it's extremely fast, especially when you have so many miles of levee to protect. Within 48 hours, the river was expected to rise a full two feet above their levee. The community now faced the Herculean task of raising the levee an additional three to four feet along most of its 52-mile length. <laughs> Volunteers, the National Guard, even prisoners from a local correctional facility pitched in to help. A flood fight isn't merely a battle of height, but a battle of time, since a waterlogged levee becomes vulnerable to collapse. As the river rises, it bears down on the walls with the force of hundreds of pounds per square foot. Inevitably, the water will find its way through any weak spot. At the base of the levee, the full weight of the water makes the pressure even greater. Water seeping through the ground below poses a threat to the entire structure. You feel that the levees are these, you know, these immortal structures, you know, that they, that they won't fail. And, and you just, the thought of them failing was very far beyond my imagination. But every levee in the Quincy area did fail, except the Sny. Hundreds of thousands of acres were flooded and the river continued to rise. Historically, when a levee would break, you could go home. I mean, it was the end of the flood. But in 1993, it, it just didn't make any difference at all. You knew the water was coming back up. And the crest seems to be in the Quincy Hannibal area someplace. Working around the clock, the Army Corps of Engineers tracked the river's relentless rise. Interesting hydrographs there. You want to put Quincy up, please? Uh, Quincy this morning was 30.95. Um, what we're seeing here is effects of levee breaks. Uh, here we hit a stage and we broke, broke a levee and it, uh, the river dropped. As the levee district fills up, it comes up again. Le another levee broke. Here a levee broke. And here we are today. It's, it's recovering from that. Uh, the crust historically has always been a singular event. In 1993, we had multiple crests. You know, all of them potentially uh, fatal to a levee district. I mean, the levee's not a perfect structure, especially when you push it up with bulldozers and you're throwing sandbags. I mean, three or four inches, all it takes is just one little, one little depression, and you're a goner, and ultimately that's what happened.
On July 25th, the levee collapsed after defying the river for nearly a month. More than 55,000 acres were inundated, wiping out the season's crop in one of the largest agricultural losses of the flood. It was very depressing because the Sni had held out the longest of any of them, and you really, if we had made it one more week, I think we would have been out of the hot water. A friend of mine called and I said, do you know where it broke? And he said, yes, it broke at the barn. And so I knew then that it had broken right on top of our farm. And I just remember, I mean, I just burst into tears. To be honest with you, it sounds funny, but I was almost a little bit relieved. Um, I knew we were going to go through, you know, quite a ride uh, because the, the river did break uh, on our farm. Um, but it was almost a relief at that point. It wasn't really depressing, I don't think, until the water went down and uh, we, we saw the sand, you know, just nothing but sand, um, just for acres and acres and acres. I mean, that was tough. Nearly one million tons of sand from the broken levee were dumped on their farm. Although their home was safely located up on the bluffs, Lynn and Alec lost over 140 acres of prime farmland. And this was just the beginning. Surging south, the floodwaters were now working their way from Quincy toward the heavily populated city of St. Louis. Here, most of the city's residents felt they had little to fear. This large urban area had armed itself with the best protection money could buy. A flood wall designed for a massive flood one that the law of averages predicted would occur only once in 500 years. But on the night of July 22nd, the city's fortress of protection began to crumble. A leak had developed on the flood wall's northern end. Overseeing emergency operations in St. Louis, was the Army Corps of Engineers, Emmett Hahn. What you have to visualize here is if in fact this, this panel fails here and falls, you have 14 to 16 feet of wall of water that comes rushing through here and it's going to take out everything in its way. And it's going to go from here to the north leg of the arch and inundate everything that's in its way and nothing's going to stop it. And it scared the living bejesus out of all of us because of the implications of what you could have happen if in fact it failed and we weren't able to hold it. Working at the base of the failing concrete panel, engineers and city workers struggled to control the leak with 100 tons of fine rock and sand. Meanwhile, in South St. Louis, a desperate battle was being played out. The river De Pere, an underprotected tributary, was filling up with excess water from the swollen Mississippi. Days earlier, several city blocks disappeared beneath the river. But now, the floodwaters were creeping toward an area where 51 propane tanks sat each holding 30,000 gallons of the highly volatile liquid. So on a day that the river rose to just unbelievable heights, uh, the first tank uh, started to raise, the water started to raise the tank and broke the cable. And the inspector at the site said it sounded like a rifle shot and pretty soon uh, it just was kept repeating itself over and over again until all of the tanks had broken all of their cables. And uh, that's when everybody got concerned. A few of the tanks were leaking, creating the horrifying possibility that a spark could set off a fireball one mile wide over South St. Louis. We were sitting on a bomb that uh, could go off at any time because I knew what the product was, I knew what the potential danger was, and usually with propane it always ended in a disaster. So. Their hope was to dissipate the leaking propane with water since it tends to hang like a fog in air. The worst danger about it is that it's heavier than air, unlike natural gas. Propane would lay along the ground 
and just creep along the ground in a cloud until it reached a source of ignition, at which time it would explode. 250 miles away, by a freak coincidence, a propane explosion rocked Kansas City. It showed what just a few hundred gallons of liquid propane could do compared to the million and a half in St. Louis. And still, no relief from the flood was in sight. We went from the river where we had the river boats break loose. We had part of the flood wall was failing. Uh, the river was going to an unprecedented record high of 49 feet for sure we were new then. Um, we had the propane incidents. The Corps of Engineers was telling us we're not sure how much higher the river is going to go. All of our, our levees and our makeshift sandbag levees were failing all at one time. And then all of a sudden, it was just like uh, it was uh, God decided we had enough. On Sunday morning, August 1st, an event took place 30 miles south in Columbia, Illinois, that spared St. Louis. As the river broke through the Columbia levee, it immediately relieved pressure on the propane tanks. It created such a suction on the Mississippi River, it drew the water away from St. Louis. It was unbelievable how fast the river dropped on the St. Louis side when the levee on the Illinois side broke. But in Columbia, the break was a disaster. Three generations were born and raised in this house. In less than an hour, Virgil Gumersheimer and his wife lost everything. Yeah, we just seen that we were going to lose it, so then we, we left, and then I went about a mile north and stood on the levee and uh, watched things wash away. It was, uh, really, it was so spectacular, uh, I didn't realize it was my stuff that was washing away. From St. Louis, the Mississippi had shifted its assault downstream to Columbia, Illinois, threatening other river towns further south in a domino effect. The tiny village of Valmire became the river's next casualty. These two losses, Columbia and Valmire, were a painful defeat for Dave Mueller who had been heading up the Army Corps of Engineers flood fight here for over a month. It's like getting kicked in the gut, and uh, you know, it was uh, probably the worst day of my life. I don't know how else to say it, because uh, we, you know, you get to know the people after that long. I mean, we've, uh, we work night and day with them, uh, and I don't think we ever really, and, and even in our, our faintest imagination, ever thought the levees were gonna fail. We always thought uh, we were gonna beat it. Uh, you know how you always figure hard work and determination will take care of everything? Well, it's not necessarily so. You can't beat Mother Nature sometimes. It, it, was, a, it was a real cruel lesson to learn. Uh, like I said, it probably was the worst day of my life. The river swallowed up 14,000 acres of farmland, and the rampage had just begun. Heading south, the renegade waters rushed over a pair of levees near the town of Valmire. The floodwaters were then free to spread over a 47,000-acre valley before running up against their next obstacle, a second set of levees just north of Prairie de Rocher. Designed to hold the modest flows of Rocher Creek, these levees would now have to serve a new role, protecting the town from the full force of the encroaching floodwaters from the north. People living in this unprotected valley were helpless. It was like waiting for two days to have a terrible tragedy hit you that you knew you were going to lose your home. And the two of us was able to get back in here even though we weren't supposed to. We were very determined to try to save more of our things. 
and we came out here and uh, you walked through your house and looked at each other and you knew it was gone, you know, you'd lost it. And, uh, you know, a fire is terrible, but it's over. This was like torture that didn't, wouldn't quit. <laughs> All that separated Prairie de Rocher from disaster were two slender levees running along either side of Rocher Creek. But after Valmire, this Lamnid defense could not be counted on. Once it breached up above Valmire, and I knew Valmire was going under, like I said, I, like, I went into the emergency operation basically with tears in my eyes saying, uh, I can't do this again. With only 48 hours before the floodwaters reached Prairie de Rocher, the Corps and local officials had to come up with a strategy to outsmart the river. Early on in the flood fight, we talked about, you know, just what if, you know, what if the levee breaks at Valmar? And, uh, uh, you know, what do we do down here? Do we try to hold it or do we let it out? And the answer from the Corps was, we build levees, we don't tear them down. And, uh, so the, but Dave Miller was the one who said, you know, he went back to his superiors and told them that uh, if that does break at Valmar, we have to open it and let it out. There's no other way. It's going to find its own way out, and we will have no control. The plan was to fight water with water by deliberately opening a hole in the levee along the Mississippi's main channel. This incoming water would create a back flood a wall of water that would meet and cushion the force of the floodwaters coming from the north, reducing their impact on the levee. Even more important, the hole would allow water pouring in from the flooded valley to drain back into the Mississippi River. Well, most Corps of Engineers projects are, are well designed, well thought out, and it might take several years to go through the design and construction. During a flood, you don't have that luxury. You have to make a lot of decisions on horseback, as it were. In the case of that Prairie Rocher decision, we found out at first light that the levee was broken upriver, and we had to make a decision that day as to what to recommend. By noon, the plan went into action. Equipment was brought in to cut open a 400-foot hole in the levee. Meanwhile, the encroaching floodwaters were transforming the valley just north of Prairie de Rocher into a sea. Hundreds of people flocked to Prairie de Rocher to shore up its defenses. A patchwork of sandbags, clay, and rock, the levee hardly seemed up to the task. But the odds did not deter the volunteers. They were reluctant to even leave because the water was rising so fast that the sandbags that they put down, they had to hold down with their foot in order to grab another one because the water was gonna knock it out. And they were just terribly tired. I mean, they were exhausted. And yet, I told them to go home. I mean, what's the use? They turned right around, went right back. To make matters worse, the hole being cut in the levee was too small to drain water into the Mississippi fast enough. They resorted to a dangerous last option, blowing open a second hole with dynamite. There was no more options, that was it. The only concern I think that uh, we had about the, the dynamite, and, and, and I, this was rightfully so, uh, not so much that our levy would liquefy, but we didn't know what the, the concussion would do to the delicate situation at St. Genevieve, just a few miles to our south. Uh, they, were, they were fighting a battle under you know, tremendous odds. They had rock levees around the town, just reinforced with sandbags, 20 feet high. And you, you, just, don't, you just don't hold the Mississippi River with 20 foot. Rock levees. St. Genevieve's makeshift levees were protecting some of the earliest French colonial architecture in the nation. Although their neighbors' homes were at stake and a prized piece of American history, Prairie de Rocher was desperate. I really didn't expect it to survive the night, and I was, I was worn out, and uh, it looked to me like it was hopeless. 
And uh, I finally went home and I told my wife, it'll all be full of water in the morning. I, I think it's going to go. That was the first time, I think, that it ever that I had thought that it was, it was going to be inevitable. Well, then I heard blast about whenever the first blast went off. No, nobody's had any experience blowing up levees, let's uh, put it that way. So they were, you know, they kind of had to learn as they went, too. And, uh, but uh, the second one did, uh, did the job. Well, then I got up at daylight, and uh, I flew the levee again, and, and I broke ground. We still had, we still had a levee that was holding. Prairie de Roche's levee remained intact as did St. Genevieve's, just five miles away. The townspeople of Prairie de Rocher could hardly grasp their good fortune. I think we've been visited with a miracle. I got no other explanation. Lots of hard work, but in the end, that was unbelievable. You had to be here to witness it, and the feeling is marvelous. Keeping Prairie de Rocher safe was a precious victory for everyone involved. And I guess it did work. Uh, at least we saved Prairie de Rocher, which was our main goal. Uh, like I said, it, it was our only win, <laughs> so we had to have something. There were few victories in the long summer of 1993. At the peak of the flood, an area the size of Indiana had been inundated. Although most federally constructed levees stood up well, the majority of privately built levees succumbed. Overall, the Army Corps of Engineers viewed the 1993 flood as an engineering success. It's not surprising that most of those levees were overtopped and filled up because they simply weren't designed for that kind of flood. All of the levees that were designed for a flood like 1993 did their job. This is what we expected them to do. It prevented literally billions of dollars in flood damages. Uh, the big urban levees were like St. Louis, further down river at Cape Girardeau, up river at Hannibal. All of these structures were designed for floods greater than the 1993 flood, and they did the job they were supposed to do. But it was the less populated areas, unable to afford such costly protection, that suffered the greatest losses. Valmeyer was one of those communities. After being overcome by the flood, it lay underwater for nearly two months. When the floodwaters receded, residents were shocked by what they saw. The current had gutted most of their homes, leaving them uninhabitable. Due to all of the current and mud that came along with the water at the time of the flooding, we had 90% of our homes in town that were considered, by FEMA standards, substantially damaged. So we knew that because that many buildings were in that category, we would have to come up with a different solution for the people here. Like other Valmaya residents, Glenn and Mary Rolfing had to make a tough decision, stay and rebuild or move to higher ground. I don't want to stay. No. Um. I've been afraid that what is going to come again and higher this time. So we decide I don't want to live there anymore. Well, I was born in Valmar and raised in Valmar and lived there all my life and I just wanted to stay, you know. That's about all I can say. I, like I say, I loved the home down there. It was right on the lake and kind of wildlife back there. Ducks and fish, frogs, birds. They had everything just about the way I wanted it. When the river swallowed up Valmeyer, it nearly broke apart the community of 900. Had we allowed people to go their own directions at the time of the flood, because of the damage to their property, uh, it would have meant the end of the community. And I, along with many of the other community leaders of the, at that time, were not ready to see Valmar die. 
To keep Valmeyer alive, the mayor needed to find a safe haven. Fortunately, he did not need to look far. A 500-acre site became available on this bluff 300 feet above the Mississippi and just a mile and a half away from old Valmeyer. To support the relocation, the mayor had to negotiate his way through a maze of 22 state and federal agencies. His ultimate success demonstrated how far the federal government was willing to go to remove people from the banks of the Mississippi. But no one can move a town overnight. Ever since the flood, many people from Valmeyer have been killing time in these trailer homes, enduring delays and cramped quarters. It seemed like, especially when you get to be my age, uh, I'm ready to retire. And you think, this shouldn't happen now, you know? If you're younger, things like that. It's, overcome it. Well, we will anyhow as far as that goes, but uh, it's just like three years, you know, it's just, it's just a big lapse in your life. It's... With their new home on the bluff nearing completion, the Rolfings and many others are thankful their nightmare is coming to an end. The flood of, of 93 really changed the way people think about rivers like the Mississippi. It was a cost that people endure when they live in the floodplain that's much greater than the cost of a lost crop or a lost home. It's the cost of living in fear of a river. It's the cost of being dislocated for two months. It's the cost of seeing your wedding album or your other family heirlooms being lost and swept into the Gulf of Mexico. More than 20,000 people have decided they no longer want to live with those costs. Surrendering their gutted homes to the demolition crews, they are moving to safer ground. The government has been eager to help out in order to cut down on future flood losses. Nowhere is this more needed than in St. Charles County precariously located at the confluence of the nation's two largest rivers, the Missouri and the Mississippi. The county is notorious for filing the third highest number of repeat flood insurance claims in the country. By living here, people like Drew and Lori Richmond take a gamble every time the river rises. The Richmonds were devastated by the flood of 1993, but they're reluctant to move away. It's peaceful, real tranquil out here. I mean, I can sit here at my picnic table over there. We'll listen to the squirrel's fingernails go up and down the bark of the pecan tree. I just don't want to give it up. That's, that's it in a nutshell. Got 11 acres back over there that were sort of a boat club slash proud to be here property owners club you know and uh, I want my kids to play over there like I played I want them to swim right here but every time they get flooded they can claim flood insurance payments and in some cases disaster aid payments both subsidized by the federal government this costly cycle is what county officials like Miriam Anderson are trying to break, especially since federal disaster dollars are drying up. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, you just had a whole series of, of different disasters. You had earthquakes, you had fires, you had hurricanes, you basically had something that looked like it was going to be the second coming in general. And every single time, the federal government, through the Federal Emergency Management Agency, would walk in and start handing out money. And with federal budgets being the way they are, there just isn't the money to spend anymore. And so the federal government just finally said, we've got to look at some other alternatives. We just can't keep spending money like this.
Anderson tries to buy out homes like this one. Because it's more than 50% damaged, it's been condemned by the county. What we are doing, though, is we're forcing people to look at other options and so that they're not caught in the cycle of repetitively being flooded out, being damaged, having their personal lives just devastated, and then coming back and in a few years having it happen again. For those determined to stay, there is an option, though not a cheap one. For the past 16 years, Jerry Levere has been raising homes along the banks of the Mississippi. A floodplain resident himself, he's weathered many floods in his own elevated home. Everybody says, why do you live out in the flood? Why do you live out in the flood? It don't flood all the time. We just happen to have one big one that kind of just caught us with our pants down. We learn from that. The counties learn from that. The governments learn from that. Height is the only sure way to beat a rising river. So St. Charles County could turn into a community of treetop homes. Over the years, Levere has elevated 120 homes, refining his floodproofing skills along the way. Okay, here's another one of our houses. This is a typical 28 by 64 modular home. And what we done, we made it flood proof and we got it up above the flood and we put a little class to it and decorated it up and we put a nice deck with a tree that grows through it. And there's several other things you have to remember during the flood, the force of the water. So what we have to do is make sure the water is equal pressure uh, when the water's coming up. So what we did, we come up with, instead of putting a solid wall, we put a breakaway wall. And what the breakaway wall consists of, and the current from the river being right here on the river, they have a lot more current than the normal people does. So what they can do before the flood, they can come in here and they can raise this whole wall up and hinge this up and the water can flow through here real evenly and there's no bunch of pressure on it. And if it gets extremely heavy, we use a single pane glass that will break away. Another thing that we really like and that kind of like a superstructure that we designed. We put independent floating foundations. These beams look like they're just sitting on the floor, but what they do, they go down in the ground and we have a 36 inch auger that bores the holes and we put them deep to how high the house is. They're 36, 48, 52 inches deep. And then what we do is uh, we pour the concrete and then we go on up here and you can see the beam that holds the house up and it's welded and it's welded to the trailer house itself and if it was a regular house, it'd be metal tab bolted to the floor joist. And then we put the turnbuckles and the cables. So we got a superstructure. So what we do, if we have a house or a tree or a gas tank floating down the river and bouncing off this thing, it's not gonna take our house. It might take our walls, which are interior non-bearing walls, but it's not gonna take the superstructure that we got. So this thing will withstand one of the big floods. Low-lying St. Charles County can expect at least minor floods every two and a half to three years. But every community along the Mississippi is vulnerable. Is there anything we can do to prevent these floods? Is there anything we are doing to make them worse? In 1937, this classic government film sounded an alarm. It warned that clear-cutting and agriculture were contributing to erosion, which caused rainfall to drain more rapidly off the land. For well, the water comes downhill, spring and fall, down from the cut-over mountains, down from the plowed-off slopes, carrying every drop of water that flows down two-thirds the continent. 193. 1907, 1913. It suggested that such heavy use of the land may have contributed to a string of floods in the early part of the century. This idea is now being studied with modern methods. Geographer Jim Knox, working in the uplands of southwestern Wisconsin, is searching for evidence that will show whether agriculture has had a measurable impact on small to moderate floods. Knox takes a core sample from unfarmed land and compares it to soil from an agricultural core to see how they differ. 
The agricultural field shows the effects of 165 to 170 or so years of cultivation. And this uh, cultivation, of course, has exposed that soil to the elements. And this has stripped off, uh, at this site here, about a foot of sediment. Whereas we had a very porous, high permeability kind of soil at the surface before, we now have at the surface then a, a rather impermeable soil. And this, this means that uh, we're going to generate an awful lot of surface runoff, which contributes to flooding uh, in the valleys downstream and, and contributes to soil, further soil erosion and the movement of sediment into the Mississippi River system. According to Knox, the loss of topsoil as a result of farming is causing floods to increase in frequency and magnitude. There's quite a bit of evidence that uh, even the moderate magnitude floods have been increased. And the magnitude of increase for a relatively small rainstorm of about two and a half inches would be to increase the flood magnitude as much as five to six fold uh, during the worst period of agricultural land use in the early part of the century. Uh, today it's somewhat better, but it's still probably on the order of three times what it was under natural conditions. But is there a way to farm the land and still protect the precious topsoil that absorbs water and reduces flooding? Iowa State Conservationist Leroy Brown. What I have here is crop residue from the past growing season. As this residue decays, it tends to form somewhat as a sponge, and the water that falls on this land will tend to soak in and not run off. Also, that same residue protects the bare soil. When a raindrop falls on the bare soil, there's somewhat of an explosion that takes place. And this explosion dislodges soil particles, making it easier for these soil particles to run off. But when you have residue on top of that, it tends to protect that bare soil. And therefore, this residue helps to reduce the amount of erosion that occurs on farmland. These techniques may help to lessen the magnitude of floods. But even the best farming practices can't turn the land near the river back into what it once was, virgin wetlands. Unlike farmland, wetlands possess a sponge-like quality which allows them to absorb excess water in times of flooding. Spurred by the 1993 disaster, the federal government stepped up its efforts to restore wetlands along the river. Louisa County, Iowa became a focal point of this program since this agricultural area has flooded 14 times in the past 60 years. For sisters Martha Hawk and Mary Boyson, the persistent upheaval of floods has punctuated their family life. I'm not sure he ever said this, but it might have been Mom that said, uh, you know, that they just got used to it, and they knew that they were going to lose a crop occasionally, like maybe once out of every five years. Louisa County's history of levee failures placed a constant financial and emotional strain on Martha and Mary's father, whose struggle with the river was not something they had wanted to inherit. So after the 93 flooding, when conservation groups and the federal government offered to buy out landowners in the flood-prone sections of Louisa County, the sisters were tempted. Just with knowing that Dad had fought it and fought it and fought it, and, it, and that we had even in our past, I just hated to throw the towel in and draw the line and say, it's over. But the immenseness of the entire thing, like the largeness of that whole summer the water you know, was over over the land for weeks and weeks it had to come to reality it was just so big and there was so much damage so many breaks financial end of it was going to cost so much money to get the levy fixed it was hard to ignore those facts The buyout program offered the sisters a truce with the river, but it was still hard to accept. 
Yeah, Mom, during the, the buyout times, throughout the meetings, I, I think one day I said to her, I just don't know about this. This is just, you know, against everything that, that I ever thought of that would be happening. And she stated, well, your dad used to say that, you know, one day that land would go back to the ducks. Louisa County's 3,300 acres are now being returned to their former pre-settlement state as a wetland. The federal government has an interest in acquiring flood-prone land, not only because it reduces the costs of bailing out people who are repeatedly flooded, but also because it reduces flood heights for other farmers who live around the, the area that's been acquired. It also helps solve some of our environmental problems by reconnecting the Mississippi River with its floodplain. Uh, as much as we can be opportunistic and acquire land from willing sellers, we can begin to restore the Mississippi. We don't need to reclaim all of the floodplain or, or even most of the floodplain of the Mississippi River in order to have a biologically healthy river. The people of Louisa County reluctantly decided they could no longer face the threat of another flood like 1993. One. Oh, you got your fingernails. Two. Oh my gosh. Three. Played beauty shop. But others, like Lynn and Alec House, continue to live with the risks. I'm the fourth generation of my family farming in the Sny Island uh, drainage district. We have never had a failure. We have had uh, threats, certainly in the past. Uh, they've never had a failure in modern history. I think that the, that the risk is very, very acceptable, considering the fact that this is the richest farmland, certainly in, uh, probably in North America. Certainly it's a risk. Uh, we had a failure in 1993 but is it something that is going to affect my day-to-day -day life? Absolutely not. Is it something that's going to affect my uh, willingness to uh, invest in this area? No. After, uh, land prices are higher after the flood than before. Um, I, when I think of something risky, I think of maybe living in California uh, near a fault. So while it was very popular in the news media in 1993 that, oh, you're in a flood plain, oh my goodness, I mean, this is a reoccurring problem. It's something you constantly have to fight. That's really not the case. It's certainly not the case here. Although hydrologists classified this flood as a rare 100 to 500 year event, it is entirely possible that a flood of this magnitude could occur again in our lifetime. A 100 year flood has a one in 100 chance of occurring. Well, that means that you've got a 1% chance in any given year that a flood like that could occur. So in 1993, you know, our number came up, but we had that happen. But we, what that means is that we've got the same percentage, 1% happened in 1994, 1995, 1996, and so forth. Since 1993, about 20% of the flood's victims have retreated from the Mississippi, no longer willing to gamble with the river. Over a hundred years ago, Mark Twain cautioned us about the Mississippi, warning that we cannot tame that lawless stream, cannot save a shore which it has sentenced, cannot bar its path with an obstruction which it will not tear down, dance over, and laugh at. But the lure of the Mississippi is great. In the devastating wake of the 1993 flood, most river dwellers have chosen to stay despite the certainty that someday the river will return. To respond to this program or to find out more about NOVA, visit NOVA's website at pbs.org or America Online, keyword PBS.
To order this show or any other NOVA program for $19.95 plus shipping and handling, call WGBH Boston Video at 1-800-255-9424. Nova is a production of WGBH Boston. Major funding for Nova is provided by the Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television. Science. It's given us the framework to help make wireless communications clear. Sprint PCS is proud to support NOVA. This program is funded in part by the Northwestern Mutual Foundation. Some people already know Northwestern Mutual can help plan for your children's education. Are you there yet? Northwestern Mutual Financial Network. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS.